Good morning, everyone. Glad to see all of you here. Uh, God has been uh, just using our church, and it's an opportunity for us to be able to reach out, not only to the four corners of this church, but how many of you know that there's a city out there that needs the gospel and needs to feel the love of God? And so our first, and of course, our first uh, uh, priority is to love God first, and then out of the overflow of our love for God, we love others. And so uh, thank you. Thank you for being part of that. And you may not be aware of that, but you have been a part of that. Through your giving and generosity, we've been able to extend, uh, you know, a gift uh, and, you know, just help to others. So but please just tell the person beside you, thank you. Pasalamat ka naman. Thank you so much. And just tell the person beside you, thank you for being a blessing to others. All right. Uh, my name is Pastor Ariel. I'm one of the pastors of this congregation. And today we are continuing our... Uh, series entitled, nonetheless, Pare Pare, Love the City. And so this is a focus actually on how, as a church, uh, we're able to extend uh, the love of God to others. And so we talked about last week how God has been compassionate uh, first to us, that you and I have been chosen. Everybody say, I am chosen. And how many of you are grateful that you have been chosen by God? No matter what background you were uh, in, God does not uh, use that as a criteria for His choice for us. But out of His compassion, out of His love for us, out of His purpose, He chose us. We also saw that last week God has been compassionate uh, to His people. And so, uh, you know, that God, uh, His, His main uh, attribute aside from Him being a holy God, is that He is a compassionate and a gracious God. Uh, we also uh, learned that last week uh, we're called to obedience, that out of the choice that God did for us, God calls us as a church and as a people to be able to uh, be a blessing, uh, not only to our families, but actually to others as well. You know, as I was going through this um, study, and as we're continuing uh, today in Love the City, we're going to be talking about God's heart for the poor. Now, how many of you are familiar with poverty in the Philippines? Please raise your hand. If you're not raising up your hand, where have you been? Anyway, so uh, I think when you talk about poverty, poverty is all, across, all over the place, right? You see that as something that is almost, I don't want to say it's normal, but it's endemic. It's, 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 you know, it's, uh, we see that in the streets. You probably grew up with that. Uh, before we dive in, into this, uh, we're going to be focusing also in the book of Deuteronomy. As I was looking at this, there's a particular book uh, that was written by Michael Shapiro. He's a Jewish author, and the title of the book uh, is The Jewish 100. And this is actually the ranking of the most influential Jews of all time. Okay, so it's an interesting book. I haven't really dove and read that book, but I actually just saw the, the prelude of that book. And uh, among the top 100, you will see uh, uh, Bob Dylan <laughs> in the 90s there. Of course, um, you would see that there's a lot of different uh, uh, actors and business people that are there. But this is actually uh, a summary of the Jewish most influential of all time from the beginning of time. So in religion, in politics, in music, in commerce, uh, law, sports, diplomacy, philosophy, literature, arts, and even in motion pictures. Okay, So Steven Spielberg is actually part of that list. Okay, So I'm pretty sure that... You're familiar with him. Grucho Marx is a Jew, a part of that list, okay? Um, we don't have the time to go through the 100 because that will eat up our preaching today. But let me start with six and up, top six, okay? Number six is Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. Now, how many of you have been impacted by the writings of the Apostle Paul? You're probably reading the epistles, and, you know, uh, this, he, he wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament, an amazing uh, guy who was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Number five uh, is our patriarch Abraham, okay? Uh, the Jews and even the people outside uh, Israel would consider him as the father of the faith, Abraham. Number four, uh, what's interesting is actually Sigmund Freud, Okay, the, the, the father, the founder of the psychoanalytics. Uh, number three is Albert Einstein. 
How many of you have been impacted by his study? Okay. Uh, Oppenheimer, you watched that. Okay. So familiar with this word, the theory of, rel- uh, theory of relativity. One genius uh, in our modern time. Okay. Uh, number two is Jesus. Okay. So you probably are surprised. Why number two long? Okay. Now this is considering of all time. So even during the time before Jesus was born, okay, he's considered, of course, we are disciples of Jesus. We're followers of Christ. So definitely when you talk about your change and transform life, how many of you know we will attribute that to the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. He is for us the most influential in our time, but of all time, number one is Moses. Okay, so the reason why Moses is number one is because, of course, uh, he predates uh, Jesus. He was born before, uh, before Jesus was born. He's the lawgiver of Israel. Uh, in fact, Moses was the most quoted author, even in the New Testament, that even Jesus himself quoted a lot from Moses. Remember the time when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? By the devil, and then he said, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Those were coming from the book of Deuteronomy, the book that Moses uh, has written. Basically, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, what's the third one? Leviticus, fourth is Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy becoming the fifth, is the fifth book of the Bible, uh, this is considered to be the mega sermon of Moses. Okay, this is the last. So if you can imagine, if you have a pastor that you've been walking for the past 40 years in the wilderness, you're familiar with his voice. And then at the cusp of the entry of, from the wilderness to the promised land, Moses delivers the ultimate sermon of all time. The final words, the second reading of the law. How many of you know that that is so significant? That is so important because that is actually what you call habilin. Moses was not able to qualify to enter the promised land because of some anger issues. Okay, we know that. If you read your Bible. But yet, at the very verge, at the border of the wilderness into the promised land. From the time that they have experienced manna in the desert and the moment that they enter promised land, they will enjoy the fruit of the land. Moses was delivering the mega sermon, the last sermon that is so important because this identifies the Jews as the people of God that is so different from the nations of the world. In fact, if you look at the first four chapters of Deuteronomy, and I encourage you to read this book, Deuteronomy. Uh, it's a nice narrative. It's a summary of all the things that they have actually gone in the wilderness. Done in the wilderness. The first four chapters basically gives us a thesis of what Deuteronomy is all about. It's basically this: worship God only, and don't worship idols. How many of you know that, that is so simple? But he unpacked it in such a way that the people of God would know exactly how to live it out. In fact, he did a review in Deuteronomy chapter 5. He said right uh, off the cuff, uh, you know, off the cuff, he already mentioned the uh, Ten Commandments right there as a review in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and so on and so forth. Now, one of the things as Moses was going through in this mega sermon, He went through the uh, description of the temple. He went through some uh, dietary laws, which animals are okay for your diet and which are not okay for your diet. And how many of you know that we're not Jews, so we don't even care? (laughs) Actually, we kind of like eat those that are forbidden. (laughs) And we don't have to get a summary of that. I think it's more of a dietary law, more than a ceremonial law. What is not good for you, don't eat for us. But yet, we know that the Apostle Paul also said that eat everything in faith. Though not everything is beneficial, everything is permissible, 
as long as you do not make someone stumble in your choice of food. Then he went on the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, which is a very controversial chapter, and we're going to find out why. So if you have your Bibles with you, open to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 15, and we're going to be reading from the first uh, 11 verses, and then we will unpack it and see the heart of God for the poor and for His people. I'd like to invite everybody to stand with me as we give reverence to the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 to 11. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. How many of you know? And you're rejoicing right now. Yes. This is actually a command that Moses was giving to the people of God as they are about to enter the promised land. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. And you will see that the heading of this particular chapter was the sabbatical year, the seventh year. Verse 3, it says, Of a foreigner you may exact it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. Verse 4, But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today, for the Lord your God will bless you. Let's say those words. The Lord your God will bless you. Tell the person beside you, the Lord your God will bless you. It's interesting that the Lord was, through Moses, was declaring, there will be no poor among you. Because what? The Lord your God will bless you. Now, how many of you are claiming that promise? Come on now. What an amazing promise. They're about to exit wilderness, enter into the promised land, and Moses was saying, there will be no poor among you, but the Lord your God will bless you. Only if you are strictly going to obey the voice of the Lord, command you today. As He promised you, you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. In fact, this particular promise was even laid out in detail in Deuteronomy chapter 28, when we will, you know, if you read further down uh, in that book. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. But you shall what? Open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care lest be an unworthy thought in your heart and say, the seventh year, the year of the release is near. <laughs> Sixth year na. <laughs> may utang pa, may pahabol. And your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and give him nothing. And he cried to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake verse 11 for there will never cease to be poor in the land therefore I command you you shall open wide your hand to your brother to the needy and to the poor in your land this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that brings life. It, it brings assurance to us. It brings us hope. 
thank you, Lord, that even as we look and dive into this particular command, I pray that you would give us ears to listen, and I pray, God, that you would give us open hearts, give us an open hand. I pray, God, that you would continue to allow us to have our cups open so that you can fill it afresh. Lord, bless your people today, God. Lord, change our minds at even, and help us to have a glimpse of your heart for the poor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. Now, I know what some of us are thinking, including myself. Pastor, if we preach about this, baka magkautang-utang tayo dito sa church natin. Which I think is possibly happening. But yet, that's why I want to go and talk about this and dive into this particular command because there are some nuances of this and how the Jews are a theocratic rule. Uh, they are actually under a theocracy. Uh, God ruling through uh, the, you know, the priests, but we are under a democracy. So there's like a, a kind of a difference in the way we talk about, for example, like public policy, economic plans. Okay, so there are that's a, a huge um, area of discussion, but we're not going to dive into that. How many of you know that when you talk about poverty, as I said earlier, poverty in the Philippines is real. I mean, if you look at the picture, this is happening around us. It is real. It is not imaginary. You actually just have to go out of your comfort zone, outside of your home, drive around the metro, and you will see glimpse and reality of poverty. Even in our city here in Montenlupa, just cross SLEX and you will see a little bit of that. Drive across Manila, you will see that there's a lot more of that. Drive towards the provinces and you will see even more glimpse of that. You know, growing up, I'm not sure if I share this. I grew up in Tondo. I was born and raised there my first seven years. About two to three blocks away is my home from what you used to call Smoky Mountain. So you don't just see poverty, you smell it. I mean, you smell it, you see it, you hear it, you experience it. You don't even need statistics to know that it is real, but so that it will validate the fact that we are uh, in a poor uh, economy, According to the 2020 State of Food National Nutrition in the World Report by the Food and Agricultural Organization of United Nations, a staggering 59 million Filipinos lack consistent access to food, almost half. I mean, if you look at our population of about 112 million, about 59 million lack consistent access to food, this means that a significant portion of our population faces the harsh reality of hunger and food insecurity. In the 23, uh, 2023 World Bank's poverty and equity brief for the Philippines, it was reported that 19.9 million Filipinos fall under the national poverty line. This means that they are living in conditions where meeting even the basic needs is a daily struggle. To put this into perspective, how much is the threshold for poverty in the Philippines for a family of five? Guess how much it is. 12,030 pesos a month is what you need if you have a family of five so that your basic needs would be met. Food, shelter, clothing, health care. In order to survive, you need about 12,030 pesos every month. And how many of you, not majority, many of our countrymen, have a difficulty trying to meet that on a monthly basis. That's why I believe that as a church, we need to soften our heart and harden our feet. We need to have the heart of God, and we need to have feet that are steady and are ready so that we can actually minister. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 5 
says, whoever mocks the poor insults their maker. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18, command them, who is them here? The rich, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Now, of course, when you talk about poverty, when you talk about being in need, when you talk about being rich, how many of you know that these are all relative? How can you measure one's wealth? How many of you know that if you are rich, that's relative because you have a lot of relatives, depending on you. <laughs> I mean, it's relative. You know, how can you determine, you know, am I rich? Am I in the middle class, upper middle, lower middle, 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 middle? Is that rich? But if you can eat three times every single day, you have shelters, shelter on your head, you can access transportation to go from point A to point B, you have shoes on your feet, and you have access to Medicare or to medicine. How many of you know that that is a blessing? Come on now. That is a blessing. And with that, we're grateful. That's why we're, where are we? Where is our stand? Soften your heart. Harden your feet. Jackie Pollinger spent about 50 years in Hong Kong ministering to the outcasts, the addicts, the poor, uh, the marginalized, the, the sex slaves, the prostitutes. And she said, God wants us to have soft heart and hard feet. The trouble with many of us is that we have hard hearts and soft feet. We're kind of like oblivious to what's happening around us. How many of you know that God wants us to have soft hearts, hearts of love, hearts of compassion, hearts of generosity, because He's calling us to make a different difference in this world. My question for us this morning is, what's the condition of your heart? You don't have to answer that. Is it soft? Is it callous? What's the condition of your feet? Pastor, kaka-pedicure ko lang. It's soft and supple. We need to actually have tough feet in a sense that we're able to walk out there and meet challenges because we're asked to travel tough paths. Three lessons that we can actually glean from this particular passage and it's interesting because we're talking about release of debts. Now, how many of you have, in one form or the other, have some sort of debts? Mortgage, business debts, house debt, credit card debt. Please raise your hand. Car loan, please raise your hand, okay? I'm raising up my hand. I'm one of those, okay? All right. First lesson is God is generous. And he wants his people set free. How many of you know that debt is a burden? And the Bible says that the borrower is a slave to the lender. Debt brings about bondage. And Moses was reminding them, guys, we just got out of slavery in Egypt. And God wants us free in the promised land. And this ought to be our status because our God is a generous God. So let me just read this from the NIV version to have give us a different perspective. At the end of the seven years, you must cancel debts. And this is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner... And you may, must cancel any debt your fellow Israelite owes you. Part of the blessing of the Lord is an eradication of debts. I know what you're thinking. Hold your horses. Pastor, it's my sixth year in my mortgage. I can go to the bank. My next year... According to the Bible, I'm supposed to be debt-free. I mean, if, is this the application of this particular scripture? Eh, Christiano yung may-ari ng banko. 
How many of you know that if that becomes a public policy, businesses will close? Because this is not an economic plan that we are actually trying to subscribe. But you know, when you study Scripture, and I was asking some of our pastors in our study of this, and some of our theologians, I was asking them, is this a literal cancellation of debts? You know what they said? Yes. There are some views theologically that on the seventh year is actually a year of moratorium. It's a freezing of collections. That's another view for this. But of course, I am not a Jew. And the actual practice is that they release their brothers from their debt and gives them a chance to be zero debt. Can you imagine the beauty of that? Imagine yourself waking up in January 2025, debt-free. Wow! How many of you know that that is heaven on earth? That is a release. That is actually, wow, you're, you're loosening me of all the burden of all the loans and the mortgages and the debt that I have with everybody. And Lord, you're giving me uh, ground zero, point zero, you know, a fresh start. And I'm debt free. Now, of course, we cannot just go to the creditor and say, yeah, and claim this promise. Give me my money. Okay, you can't, can't do that, right? <laughs> Set me free. But the debt that Deuteronomy is addressing is really a debt when the people had come to the point of poverty that they cannot actually go out. Now, there are different kinds of debts. There's a lot of different consumer debts that we have right now, credit card debts, as I said earlier, car loans, mortgage. These are consumer debts. You have a debt, but how many of you know that you can still eat? You have debts, but you can still enjoy, you know, you pay your bills, you can actually have a nice air con, uh, you know, uh, in, in your home. You eat out many times, and you accumulate more debts. We're not talking about that kind of debt. The debt that we're talking about here in the context of the Israelites is the people are selling themselves as slaves. Debt. That is the kind of debt that they had. Because they have no way to pay off whatever obligation they have. Maybe the Lugi Negosh or whatever. They lost everything. We don't know the, the situation. But they have to sell themselves as slaves. You call this indentured debtor or indentured servants. They become slaves because of an obligation that they cannot pay anymore. And they actually just sell themselves to a fellow Israelite. I can't pay you anymore. Let me be your slave. And for seven years, I'll be serving you faithfully. And I'll be here on the seventh year. We are to release our brothers from whatever obligation that they have so that they can have a chance to live. How many of you know that is the context of this? Not because they actually racked up on different kinds of loans, but yet they're still okay. It's not a consumer type of debt that we're looking at in this particular case. And to support this, if you go further down in the chapter in verse 12, it says, If your brother, a Hebrew man, this is the same chapter, we stopped reading in 11, but in, to give us context, what kind of debt this is, if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you what? Six years, and in the seventh year, you shall let, go, uh, let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. Verse 14, you shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press, as the Lord your God has blessed thee. You shall give to him, and you shall remember. Moses was reminding them, guys, remember, you were slaves before. 
You were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God, what? Redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. How many of you know that God's heart for the poor and God's heart even for His people is to bless them and to set His people free? Amen. And this is one thing that we can actually ask the Lord. Lord, and how many of you know... I, let me just ask you this. How many of you would rather be on the position of a lender than a debtor? Lender, part of the promise, you will be lending to many, but you will be a debtor to no one. I would rather be on the position of having all the resource. Maganda na yung ikaw yung inuutangan at namimigay kaysa tayo yung umuutang at nanghihingi. That is a big difference in the position. And God wants us to be in that position wherein we can actually experience the blessing of God. Secondly, God wants to bless His people and put their trust in Him. Verse 4, it says, However, there need to be no poor among you, for in the land of your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance. He will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. I believe the heart of God is to remove poverty from among His people. Poverty was not even there before the fall. God blessed Adam and Eve in the garden. He gave them everything they need. Had they obeyed God, how many of you know we're still going to be in the garden? And we won't feel the effects of the fall. But, you know, the fall happened. Sin came. And part of the consequence of sin is poverty. But that's not the heart of God for His people. How many of you know that if we are in Christ, there is hope? Amen. God wants to restore us back to where He wants us to be. Verse 6, it says, For the Lord your God will bless you as He promised you, and you shall what? Lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. This is a position of head and not the tail. Lender, not a borrower. Blessed instead of being cursed. Now let me just be careful that we ought not to judge. The reason why people are in poverty is because, eh, kasi Christian, eh. Please don't do that. Poverty is more complex than just making a sweeping statement like that. There could be a Christian who's been tithing, been doing all he can to obey God, made the wrong decision, and in one day lost everything. How many of you know that that could happen? But we can never question the intention, the motive, and the love for God by that brother of ours. Kaya humirap yan kasi nga, curse. No, we cannot do that. Our stance ought to be, how can I help? How can I stand with you? Whether in prayer, if you have the power and capacity to help, let's go do it. Because I believe that God wants to use us as hands and feet to be a blessing to others. You know, as they are entering into the promise, and I can just imagine the mindset of the Israelites. They're excited. Moses was handing over the baton to Joshua. Joshua, bala ka na. These are the people of Israel who was born in the desert. Now, mind you, just to give us a perspective, the first generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt died in the desert, within the 40-year span, just so that we can have perspective. Remember that 12 spies that Moses sent? 10 out of 12 gave negative reports and brought fear, and God had to actually purge that generation. Only Joshua and Caleb gave good reports, and God promised that these are the original, the OGs from Egypt who will enter into the promised land. Out of all the people that came out of Egypt, it should have been Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, but Moses at the final hour was disqualified because of, yeah, anger. 
But then it was Joshua and Caleb who entered the promised land. Now the generation that was born in the desert is that generation that Moses was talking to. And Moses was actually giving them a warning. You know, you've been in the wilderness for so long. You're used to being in the wilderness and sometimes you feel like the promised land is the promised land. Be careful not to have clenched fists when you enter the promised land. Because the tendency for this generation might be to each, on his, uh, to each his own. Kanya-kanyang discarte na to. I'm going to have my own inheritance. I'm going to have my own lot. You know, there's going to be a division of property and I'm not going to care anymore for my brothers. That's why Moses is saying, have open arms and an open heart. Don't have clenched fists. And I believe that part of the blessing that God gives to His people and to us also is that He will bless us with more than enough. Now, how many of you pray for provision every single day? Please raise your hand. We pray that, right? Lord, give us this day our what? Daily bread. We pray for God's provision for us every day. But let me challenge you. Pray for more than your daily bread. It's not selfish and greedy to pray, Lord, give me more than my daily bread. Lord, give me more than enough. Give me more than what I need. Why? So that there's going to be provision to help others. Pray for your daily... God's default is to provide already for our daily bread. But He wants to bless us with more so that we can be a blessing to others. Last point is God wants His people to have open hearts and open hands. Verse 7, If among you one of the brothers should become poor, if any in your town becomes uh, within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Verse 6, take care that lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near. Your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and give him nothing. He cries to the Lord against you and you shall be guilty of sin. I believe that even that motive of trying to skirt away from an opportunity to help is very unfavorable in the eyes of the Lord. My prayer is that God will check our hearts today. That God will allow us, as God has blessed us with what we have. And how many of you know that whatever it is that you have right now is just the beginning of how God wants to bless you? And the promise of, and they were about to enter the promised land and they have not even tasted the fruits of the promised land. But Moses was declaring that God will bless you tremendously. Open your heart. Open your hand. The seventh year, okay, the verse 10, you shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudging. When you give to him because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Now, let me just read verse 11 because, you know, it seems like verse 11 is contradictory to what we read in verse 4. In verse 4, Moses said, there will be no poor among you in verse 4. But in verse 11, why is Moses saying this? For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Was he contradicting himself? In fact, Jesus said this same statement. Remember that? When the woman with the alabaster jar broke it, washed uh, the perfume, uh, washed the feet of Jesus with the perfume, and then wiped her hair with it, and some of the disciples said, what a waste. And Jesus, because they said, we could have given this to the poor, and Jesus said and read their mind, the poor you'll always have among you. But she did a very beautiful thing for me, because I will not be with you all the time. Even Jesus quoted this. What does this mean? For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother and the needy and to the poor 
in your land. I believe that God is wanting us to just give an opportunity for us to be able to extend of the blessings of God to others. What God is saying is, yes, it may not be you who's poor, but guess what? There will always be somebody who is in need and in poverty within your reach. What do you do with that? Interestingly, in the early description of the church in the book of Acts, and I'd like to read that, Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one uh, said that any of these things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now this is not a case for socialism or communism, okay? This is the very heart of God uh, expressed by the church being generous to one another. Ito po yung, yung umpisa, okay? It's born out of gratitude to, uh, to God. Sacrificial generosity has been in the heart of the church from day one. The early church has always practiced a generous, sacrificial giving among one another. It's just natural for them. Verse 33 says, And with great power, the apostles were giving this testimony to the resurrection of Jesus and great grace. Everybody say great power. Everybody say great grace. And great grace was upon them all. You know, the formula here is great power plus great grace equals great generosity. And what happened, they had an experience with God. There was great power preaching the word of God. There was great grace among the believers. And in verse 34, this was the description of the early church in Jerusalem. At that time, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there was not a needy person among them. That was a description. Why is that? For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was what? Distributed to each as any had need. What I'm saying is not a prescription that we do this today. I'm not asking you to take out the title deeds of your houses and property and sell them and lay it here in the altar in Akasha Hotel. And let's help everybody. What this is describing is the very heart of God that we are willing to do what we can to help, to have open hearts and to have open hands. A description of what the early church was. And I believe that we can still see this now. And we've been doing this. You guys have been generous. And we want to thank you for that. We've had opportunities to help typhoon victims. Uh, love the city. You, you've seen the report. And that's why the reason why we intentionally wanted to show you that out of your generosity and out of your generous giving, we're able to do that. We're in a good place. But how many of you know that I believe we can do more? But yet we are in a good place. The early church was also sacrificially generous. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 15, verse 25 to 27. But for now, I am going to Jerusalem to serve the saints, the Jewish believers. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Uh, for Gentile believers in Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for what? For the poor among the saints or the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual things, then they are indebted to serve them also in tangible or material things. I was reading a story of one of the early church fathers named Lawrence. He was eventually named St. Lawrence. And Lawrence was a deacon. He was one who was managing the resource of the early church. And Emperor Valerian saw that the church was advancing and he did a massive persecution during that time. And Valerian, Emperor Valerian, executed all the clergy, all the bishops, all the pastors, the priests during that time. 
and called for Lawrence because I think he was interested in having the treasury of the church so that he can add it on to his personal treasures. Emperor Valerian called Lawrence and said, I'll give you three days and I want to give you a chance to live. In three days, bring to me all the treasures of the church and I will let you live. So Lawrence is what he did. For the next couple of days, he assembled all the poor and the blind and all the needy, the disabled, those that are crippled, the orphans and the widows, and those that are marginalized because the church had been helping them for many years. And assembled them in the public square. And finally, when Emperor Valerian said, where is the treasure of the church? And Lawrence said, pointed to the poor and the marginalized, these are the treasures of the church. Now, I believe that when Jesus looks at the poor, the needy, the marginalized, in the very heart of God, that is a treasure in their hearts. In fact, if you read a, verse, a few verses before chapter 15, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, you would find the very heart of God expressed that even in the giving of the tithe, every three years, the Bible, I'm just going to summarize that. Just go back a few verses in chapter 14, the last verses. It says, every three years you are to take up a tithe and you're not to bring the tithe to help in the temple you are to use this tithe to help the poor, the needy, the widow, the orphans, the sojourners, those who are in need. That was the purpose of the tithe. God made provision even for the poor because God has it in His heart to help everybody who are in need. You know, just to give us, as I come to an, 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 a close, uh, in real life, we... It is our heart and our desire to be able to help the poor, the needy, the marginalized, those who don't have opportunity to have education. And currently, we have 1,460 scholars that we are helping. Can we just give the Lord a hand for that? 1,460 scholars. And we'd like to thank you. Through your generosity, we're able to give. This is not a plug for real life. I'm just giving you a report on what we're doing as a church. You know, we screen, filter, we choose the best of the best, underprivileged youth. These are the cream of the crop. We go from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. We don't even qualify them. You have to be part of the church. No, even those that are not yet part of Victory are given an equal opportunity to apply for scholarship in real life. And guess what? We have 897 alumni as of today, those who graduated, that we've sent out, given an opportunity for them to be able to start fresh. These are people who lived in poverty. And for the first time, they were able to taste what it is to have jobs. They were able to pay it forward, you know, uh, support their families, and even help the other scholars so that they can have the same opportunity just like them so they can actually find jobs and a good career. Out of those 897, 199 were actually licensure exam passers. Uh, amazing how <clears throat> this young people are now advancing in their life because of what we did as a church. In a small way that we can do, you know, we have CPAs, chemists, brokers, doctors, engineers, lawyers, medtech, social workers, 106 teachers. Many of them want to go back to school and educate because they were once in the school and help those who are poor and needy. This is what we're doing as a church. And I believe that these are our treasures as well. I'd like to ask the music team to join me here on stage. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. In the NIV, the Bible says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. 
when we are kind and generous to the poor. God took this metaphor so that we will understand that He is putting Himself in a position of a debtor. If you're kind to the poor, if you have open heart, open hands. And how many of you know that our God is a debtor to no one? But yet only in this opportunity and in this regard is He considering Himself I have a debt to pay because of what you're doing. I have obligated to pay. And how many of you know that God is a faithful God? When He says, I will promise to pay, I will certainly do it. And the second part of this verse says, and He will reward them for what they Would you give the Lord an opportunity to bless you? We're not going to take up an offering today. Don't worry. But I'm here to just challenge the way we think. I'm here and I'm asking, we've prayed for this. We're asking the Holy Spirit to change our hearts and our attitude towards the poor. Many times we dismiss them in the streets and we say, there's an ordinance I cannot help. But what can we do? How can we extend open hearts? open hand God wants this church to make a difference and yes I agree with you poverty is like a black hole even the government cannot fix it by itself but as a church we can make a difference yes. and I want to end this with this story there's and you may have heard of this particular story of this old man was walking down the beach one day after a storm that night and washed tens of thousands of starfish on the shore and as he was walking he saw a young boy on his way to him and this young boy was actually scooping some of the starfish and then throwing them back into the ocean going back again scooping one starfish throwing back into the ocean and this old man asked this young boy what are you doing? And this young boy said, I'm trying to save the starfish because when the sun goes up, no, they won't be able to find their way back into the ocean and they will die under the heat of the sun. And the old person said, how can you do this? There's tens of, tens of thousands of starfish across this shore. How can you make a difference? And this young boy picked up one starfish to this one. It'll make a difference. Threw it back in the ocean picked up another one to this one it'll make a difference threw it back again in the ocean and then the old man got it got his point you may not save all the thousands of starfish there but maybe to one we can make a difference maybe God can <clears throat> or is I don't know putting someone in your heart right now. A poor brother, one who is in need, maybe in your home, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe in your office. I don't know. Let God speak. Because the reality and the truth is we're all debtors. We are all debtors to God. And how many of you know that because of God's love for us, one day, He just sent His Son, Jesus, to pay all our debts, wipe us clean, and said, You are new. Tetelestai. It is finished. Debt is canceled. Debt is paid. You owe nothing to God. All your sins have been wiped clean. How do we now extend the same heart of God to others. Part of the Lord's prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. May God find in our church a church and a people that have open hearts and open minds and open hands.
let's pray. Father, thank you so much. But Lord, we come before you even today. And we acknowledge your grace. We acknowledge, Lord God, indeed, that you have been so generous to us. We don't deserve what we have, but you gave it anyway. And if you have received the Lord Jesus in your heart, you know how that feels. You know how it feels to be forgiven. You know how it feels to be wiped clean from your past, present, and future sins. You know how it feels to go to heaven one day in the assurance of that because we're no longer held accountable for our past sins. God gave us a clean slate. But yet there might be some here who have not experienced that forgiveness. There's a weight on your heart, a weight on your shoulder because of the guilt that the sin has done to you because you've committed that crime. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin brings death. The gift of God through Christ brings life. And if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, before we come and worship the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity to be debt-free before God. The ultimate debt that cannot be paid by anyone has been paid on that cross. All you got to do is to receive that. He wiped us clean and has forgiven us. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I come before you today as a sinner needing a savior asking you to forgive me I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe that he is raised from the dead therefore today I know for certain that I am forgiven my debts have been cancelled and I have been given a new life because of what Christ did thank you Father for your grace and your forgiveness and your compassion and your love for me in Jesus name I pray Amen. 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 Can we give Lord praise for that?